Well, I want to begin today the way I rarely do, with a little bit of media. I'm going to begin today with a blast from the past. This is a little 14 second clip I'm going to show you, and if you are of a certain age, you will probably recognize it right away. You won't. And, <laughs> although you might, who knows. And if you don't recognize it, I'll say a little bit more about it after it's done. So. Travel with me, if you will, just for a bit. I think I, you know, probably about 10 years old when this came out, so. Oh, there goes the sun. father enjoying lifesavers candy as the sun goes down and the dad making his son believe that he could actually do that. And of course it was one of the most popular commercials of all time because doesn't it just touch a place in our heart? Because whether we actually had a relationship like that with our father, that we would do something like that with him, or whether we wished we had a relationship like that with our dad, or whether we remember a relationship like that we enjoyed with him. Doesn't this commercial just touch our hearts with that experience of having a father who can make our eyes grow big with wonder and with awe at what we believe that he can do? Someone who makes us feel safe and protected because we know he's on our side and he's big enough to do anything. He's taking care of us, working miracles when we need them. Could that feeling in life be any more delicious? And so, of course, Lifesavers latched onto that one and put it in this commercial. That delicious feeling to know that in our earthly father, if we have been that fortunate, or at least in our heavenly father, we have a miracle-working Lifesaver of a different kind on our side. Perhaps it's this feeling or this longing that led someone in this congregation to suggest the very first idea for our new summer sermon series called Sermons by Request. And in the Sermons by Request box, someone wrote this. Why did God and then Jesus intervene in the life of humanity so much in the past, but in recent history, nothing? In other words, if my understanding is correct, where have all the miracles gone? Like the parting of the Red Sea, at least in Cecil B. DeMille's vision. Like the manna from heaven. What about all those people that Jesus healed? The feeding of the 5,000. Now those were miracles. Why doesn't God work in these ways anymore? Does God still intervene in our lives? Will you pray with me, please? Wonder-working God, we thank you for your love, for your giving birth to us, God, in your image, for your constant presence with us, for your blessings of all kinds, God, that rain down upon us. And we thank you now, God, for your word and for your Holy Spirit that guides us. And God, help us in this time to truly understand more of who you are, if that is even possible, God. To take in just a little bit more of your power, God, that we might believe in it, that we might live in it, that we might share it. And as we open ourselves now to you, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, God, bring healing and comfort and strength to every one of us here and transformation to your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so first of all, let's start with this. Our desire to see God working miracles is probably just about the most human thing that there is. There's nothing wrong with it. What else would make us feel so secure? What else would take away our fear? What else would replace our doubts with certainty, especially in times when we are struggling, when life is hard? even when life is unbearable, perhaps especially when it feels unbearable. We know what we want, right? We want to see God. 
We want to be knocked over with the glory of God so we know beyond all doubt that we are not alone, that someone much bigger than us is holding us. In other words, we're just like Philip and all the other disciples. In this passage of scripture that Michael read from the 14th chapter of John, what we don't know just from the words that were read is that they are all sitting at that last supper table with Jesus. They have been with him all those years, seen everything that he has done, experienced so much with him, and they love him. And he is actually sitting there telling them that he is about to leave. Mm -hmm. He's telling them what he is going to suffer through, that he is going to leave, that for a while they're going to be alone until the Comforter comes, the Holy Spirit. But that also he will never leave them in spirit. And of course they don't want to hear this. Of course they're terrified out of their minds. Of course they're in great dread. And going, no, 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 this can't be right. Some, something's wrong here. So that we, God will make this right. God will fix this. That's what they want more than anything. They are looking death right in the face. And of course they want to see something else. So of course Philip turns to Jesus. And after everything that he has experienced with Jesus, he actually says, believe it or not, Jesus, show us God and we will be satisfied. We will be content. We will be at peace if only you will show us God. Unfortunately, he didn't add the words just one more time. Right. <laughs> Show us God, and we won't be afraid anymore. So, of course, if this is what Philip, who had lived on a daily basis with Jesus, had to say, what more than do you and I say? Of course, here we are in 2014 with our very human need to cry out, God, show us yourself like you used to do in the days of old. It is perfectly understandable for us to ask, God, why don't you show up in the same ways anymore? Now, as I hopefully say enough here from the pulpit, I don't have all the answers. Most days I don't know if I even have any. I only have the thoughts and the words that I pray each week come from God, that God will give me to share. And so this is what came this week when I pondered this question. Two possible explanations for why it seems that we wonder why God doesn't intervene in the same way anymore. The first one is this. First of all, is who is to say God doesn't? Who is to say God doesn't still work, Bible, work miracles like the ones in the Bible? See, the things that we know about, the ones in the Hebrew Scriptures and in the New Testament, we know about them because they were written down. Written down in the most, what's probably the most widely read book in the history of humanity. Written in nearly 500 languages. In the New Testament alone, there are at least 37 recorded miracles that Jesus performed. And that doesn't even include all the signs and wonders that he did that are just sort of lumped under signs and wonders. Probably innumerable. And of course we learned about the ones in the Hebrew scriptures, about God parting the Red Sea and manna from heaven and all these kinds of things. We learn about these things every week, so of course we know about them. And surely there have been others in history that haven't been written down. And perhaps you even know some yourself. I know that there are some here who have come from a more faith healing kind of tradition who may have seen physical healings of people. I have not, but that doesn't mean they haven't occurred. You may have seen things that you honestly believe are miracles that are on par with the ones in the Bible. The thing is, though, that they haven't been written down and preached about for thousands of years, so we don't know about them. I'm sure if we could somehow reverse everything, and if Moses could be with us here today, and he could somehow read about how there is now a cure available for leprosy, which is now called Hansen's disease, but one of the most feared disease in his day, that would be an amazing miracle of God to him. I'm sure if all the eunuchs in the Bible, in the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, the eunuchs who were really the first transgendered people, I'm sure if they could have looked at the recent ep uh, episode, the recent edition of Time Magazine, and seen on the cover of Time Magazine the story 
And inside the story and the details of the struggles and the lives and the victories of transgender people. Or if Jonathan and David could walk down our aisle and get married right here in this church, like others have recently done. That certainly they would surely believe that God is working huge miracles in this day and time. So maybe it's really more just about perspective than about whether or not it really happens. That's one possibility. But the second possibility is this. Perhaps when we long to see God, when we wonder or even doubt if God still intervenes in our lives in miraculous ways, I wonder if perhaps we are looking in the wrong direction. Like that little child in the Lifesaver commercial. We're looking to God, our Father, to work miraculous signs in the sky when instead it was Jesus who turned to Philip who was also looking for that Lifesaver God. And Jesus says to Philip, whoever has seen me has seen God. And truly, truly, I say to you, all who believe in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will they do, because I go to God. Jesus is saying, of course, keep your eyes fixed on me, but don't forget, you also have to look toward one another, because whenever you see me, you see God, and greater things even than I have done, you will do. Everyone believe that here today? Yeah. Every day? Yep. Really? Yeah. I don't. <laughs> Some days it's hard. I usually get there hopefully by the end of the day, but you know, first thing in the morning when the alarm goes off, not so much. <laughs> Whenever we wonder if God still works in our lives, if God still intervenes with signs and wonders, we have to remember whenever we see Jesus, we are seeing God. Which means that whenever we see an act of understanding and kindness that transcends the business as usual days of life, we are seeing Jesus and we are seeing God. Whenever we see someone choose generosity over greed, whenever we see someone choose humanity over hatred, when we see someone who chooses to help rather than to ignore, to love rather than to just tolerate. We are seeing Jesus in our very midst. Whenever an organization like Cross Ministries helps the neighbors in Lou and Gail's neighborhood to collect over 2,000 pounds of food for our food pantry this week, we don't even know these people. It's here now for us to give away this summer. That's amazing. We are seeing Jesus, which means we are seeing God. Now we may say, especially when life is its most difficult, well, seeing God is all well and good. I really appreciate that. But really, what good is seeing God if we don't see the works of God, the miracles, the big stuff? 2,000 pounds of food is great, but why does hunger even have to exist at all? And again, Jesus says, open your eyes even wider. See me. And when you do, see yourselves. See one another. Because if you think I have performed miracles, that's nothing compared to what you can do. And I think this might bring us to the biggest reason why it seems as though God doesn't intervene in the same big ways anymore. It's because it's our turn now. Mm -hmm. For thousands of years, the Hebrew Scriptures told us that God put fiery pillars in the sky and parted the Red Sea and rained bread down from heaven for those who are hungry. And the New Testament tells us that Jesus performed all kinds of signs and wonders. So much so that he couldn't get away from the multitudes who crowded around him. All of these things happened, miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, until Philip still said, 
show us God. And Jesus said, it's your turn now. You have everything you need. You know what God can do. You have seen me live. I have shown you how to live. Now you go forth. You know what to do. Go. You go and be the way that God will intervene from now on. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Is parting the Red Sea feel a little overwhelming today? <laughs> it can. I absolutely believe that we have the power to do things that equal because of Christ living in us. I believe we have the power to eradicate hunger in this world. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that can feel a little big, especially when the alarm first goes off first thing of the day, mm -hmm. or this early on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I want to share with you a story this morning that is about working a miracle, but maybe in a more manageable way. Because if you can start with the manageable miracles, you can work up the part of the Red Sea by 3 o'clock or so. <laughs> <laughs> this is a story about my dad. I grew up until I was about 14 in Phoenix, Arizona. Lived briefly in Oklahoma, but mostly in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm not a huge fan of Phoenix, I will tell you that. But at least it was a big city, and to a teenager, a budding teenager, being in a big city is an important thing because there were malls. You know, before Facebook, there was nothing else to do but go to the mall. <laughs> that was it. You know, there was life in Phoenix. And right towards the end of my journey in junior high, my father, who worked for a trucking company, got transferred to Kingman, Arizona. Anyone ever been to Kingman? Kingman is a little town about that time. It was about 15,000 people in northwest Arizona. There is nothing in Kingman. <laughs> At least there wasn't when I was a teenager. There might be a little bit more now, but Sarah Helen and I drove through there on our way here, and I will tell you, it hasn't changed much. It is a desolate, <coughs> desolate place, void of culture. <coughs> Not void of good people, but there were no malls. The Kmart was the biggest thing happening in Kingman. I mean, there was nothing. And when my dad got transferred there, I thought my world had ended. Not only because I was being banished to, you know, the edge of the universe, <laughs> right, as I was starting high school. But I didn't know a single soul in that town. I had been there just a couple of weeks when I started high school. Knew no one. And not only that, that I was 14 and so I was beginning to struggle with those feelings that I was terrified of mm -hmm. and didn't share with anybody. Yeah. I could not have been more terrified on my first day of high school. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get up in the morning and have my dad say, you know what, let's just move back to Phoenix. Or I wanted him to just snap his fingers and somehow I would be all the way through high school and through college and you know, be a grown up and I could live wherever I wanted. <coughs> At the least it would have been great if he'd say, oh, we'll just do homeschooling. But back then it wasn't the thing it is now. I was so afraid. And I got up and was getting ready to leave for the bus, and my dad was having his morning coffee before work, and he said to me, he didn't say we're going to move back to Phoenix. He didn't say you don't have to go to school. I'm sure he wanted to scare me what I was about to go through, but he told me one thing, which was this. Always keep your sense of humor. Mm -hmm. You can get through anything in life if you keep your sense of humor. And he not only said it to me that day, but every day of my life up to that moment, he had shown me what it was like to never lose your sense of humor. My dad never made fun of other people. He never laughed at anyone else's expense. If anything, the painful part was that he told really corny jokes. <laughs> but he always could make us laugh. And I hung on to that for dear life. I had watched him hang on to it when there was no work and we didn't know where money was coming from. I had watched him hang on to it through all of my mother's many, many illnesses. I had watched him hang on to it every day of his life, and so I took that with me into that first day of high school, and it got me through high school. It got me through college when I was struggling to come out. It got me through broken dreams when I had to resign my commission in the Army because I came out. It got me through my mother's death. It even got me through my father's death. And like never before, it has gotten me through these past few weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
because there has been nothing else except laughter that has made me feel alive again, mm -hmm. especially these past few weeks. Mm -hmm. Now my dad, if he could have snapped his fingers and made all that go away from me and I didn't have to go through high school, he could have. But if he had, I wouldn't have learned how to use that gift I had inside to be who I am today. And I really, really wish I had more funny things to say in this sermon today. <laughs> but people at least have told me that I make them laugh frequently in sermons, and I do that on purpose. Yes. Because it's a spiritual gift that God gives us. Yes. It was part of my emotional DNA I got from my dad. Mm -hmm. It's part of my spiritual DNA that comes from God. Mm -hmm. So God could work all the miracles. God could fix it all for us, but then we don't become the people we're created to be. We don't become the people God wants us to know that we are. It's like the late, great Maya Angelou said, she said two things that really struck me this week. She said, when I was asked to do something good, I often say, yes, I'll try, I'll do my best. And part of that is believing if God loves me, if God made everything from leaves to oak trees, then what is it that I can't do? she said this, I believe that each of us comes from the Creator, trailing wisps of glory. Mm -hmm. We are all trailing wisps of glory. And if God does all the miracles for us, we will never know what it is like to ride those wisps. <clears throat> we would never see that we are forever wrapped in that glory. We would never say, God loves me, so what is there that I cannot do? So God says, you go forth. You do the miracles. Be the disciples. Be the miracles that I created you to be. Because Jesus has shown you the way. And the power of the risen Christ and the Holy Spirit lives in us. And sends us forth to go and do likewise. Amen. Amen. Amen.